the Lord. We welcome you to the broadcast ministries of Victory Apostolic Church, where Elder Andrew D. Singleton Jr. is the senior pastor. At Victory, we are committed to building victorious Christ-like lives through the worshiping and glorifying of God to transform the lives of all we minister to. Note what Jesus says in the 24th chapter of Matthew. To those you're sharing on television, we're blessed by your presence as well. We want you ready when Jesus comes as well. The Bible says Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to his buildings. Do you see all of these things, he asked? I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive, not a few, many. You will hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he or she who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And all of the church said, and my subject is signs of the times. The 24th chapter of Matthew is primarily about the end of world history as we know it. But as we look at this from Jesus' perspective, as far as he is concerned, history is his story. As Jesus leaves the temple in verse 2, he declares that the first part of the end is the destruction of the temple. He tells his disciples, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on one another. Everyone will be thrown down. And then in verse 3, Peter and James and Andrew and John, they asked Jesus privately. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, they came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? We get the answer to that question in Luke chapter 21, verse 20, where Luke writes, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Jesus' response had to blow the disciples' minds. You see, this was the great Herodian temple, not, not the Solomonic temple, but the Herodian temple, which was considered to be one of the architectural masterpieces of that time. Made of marble and adorned and garnished with gold. The biblical historian Josephus, who was there in the first century, said this about that temple. He said, some of the stones were nearly 70 feet in length, 12 feet high, and 18 feet in breadth. Wow. One stone. So you can see 
Why these uh, disciples going like, what do you mean this is coming down? They didn't have no cranes and heavy duty construction equipment. How in the world is what we're looking at, this tremendous temple, going to be thrown down? You see, the temple offered protection from Jesus' from the enemies of the Jews as well as a place for them to worship. Took 46 years to build it and over 10 thousand skilled laborers to complete it. It was incredible. Yet in AD 70, 37 years after Jesus prophesied it, that temple was torn down. And this is history. The Roman general Titus came with his troops, destroyed that temple, destroyed that city, and from that day till today, the Jews have no temple to worship in. One million Jews were killed as Rome took charge again of Jerusalem. The second and third questions that Jesus' disciples asked are futuristic to our time. Note what they are. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? This sign by Jesus is a prophecy of future events, not a forecast. In this weather, most of us, after taking care of incredibly personal things in the morning, want to know what the weather going to be like. I need an amen. We turn on the news and we want to know what the weather's like so we know how to dress, what to look forward to, what to... Do or not do, include not going to work. What you see on the screen was the forecast at the beginning of last week. As you can see, there was supposed to be no snow late Saturday into Sunday. <laughs> well, the reason I'm laughing is because those are the ones I read that I get excited about. Because preachers hate snow and rain. We don't like it because y'all don't come. Okay, how are you going to come if you can't get out the garage? Then, of course, later in the week, right before the week ended, now we got snow Saturday and Sunday. And as you also know, most of this forecasting is based on scientific data. But this data, the further away that the, that the weather person is making the forecast, the more inaccurate it is. It gets accurate the closer that they get to that day and to that time. That's why you don't look six months out on your birthday to see what your birthday going to look like. Because you know they don't, it, can't, it can't be accurate that far out. I want you to note something. When we talk about prophecy, prophecy is not based on scientific data. Prophecy is based on the Word of God itself. It is not a forecast. I want you to know what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 35. Heaven and earth will what? Pass away, but my words will never pass away. Prophecies always come to pass. Now, I know we live in a day and age of all kind of prophets. Everybody a prophet. Now, I'm not going to be a prophet. I'm, it's hard enough for me to be a pastor, so I ain't trying to be no prophet. Now, some prophets, pretty good, pretty true. My experience has been with quite a few of them, it's, it's you know, they just talking. That's just been my experience. Because it's easy to just run your mouth and tell everybody how they're going to be a billionaire. Tell them who they're going to marry and all of that. When, when, it's when the prophecy is put to the test of whether it comes to pass. That's the mark of the prophet. And the word of God is given to us by Jesus Christ. That word never fails. Let me work with my message. Matthew chapters 24 and 25 represent a prophetic sermon that now sweeps Jesus' disciples past the time that they live in to the time we are today and beyond. It's a time after the fall of Jerusalem. It's a time his disciples never experienced. 
Jesus' disciples understood the importance of signs. Because signs told them and us what was coming and what to do or not to do. Some of y'all, when you're driving, you do understand that signs are important. When you're driving you, your car, you can't get anywhere and not have to deal with what? Signs. And the signs are there for you. Are you driving with me? We got some people out here don't have a license. I won't name none of them. But, <laughs> but when you're driving, come right over here. D come right over there. There you go. When you're driving, the first thing you got to have is a green light. Turn, let them see your little green light, T. See, you need a green light. So if you got the green light, you what? You start going. But if I decide I want to go over here, why don't I go over here? What does that sign? Do not enter. So if you are a wise driver, you do not enter. So then you keep on driving. And as you continue your, your, your journey and wherever it is that you're trying to get to, you will run across another sign. This sign lets us know this kind of danger ahead, and your car may be slipping and sliding. That's why some people ain't here today. Because when the weather's bad and slipping and sliding, they know they can't handle it. Wise people do not go out when it's 12, 14 inches of snow. You get in and stay in, and thank God you got in. But if you keep on driving, sometimes you'll run across a sign, and this sign is railroad crossing. Now, the thing about this sign that is tragic for me, at the age of 17, two of my very good friends ignored this sign and were killed by a train. Tell your neighbor, signs are important. If you keep on driving, we come to one of your favorite ones. Because this is the, now y'all know that y'all need prayer on this one. And to show you that we all basically cowards, if you need to make the U-turn, you're not doing it in faith. You look to the left, you look to the right, you look, you look behind you. Then you make that U-turn, and if anything even look like a police car, you don't make that U-turn. <laughs> then you keep on going, and you reach a place where you see the, and if you are a good driver, you, and then after the light turns back green again, then you go on your destination. Give them a hand. Thank you. want to make a very serious point here. None of those signs had any writing on them. And all of you who drive knew exactly what every sign meant. So sign recognition is not an issue. Sign response is the issue. Can I work with this? Let my preachers give me a hand. I think it's... <laughs> See, we don't have any problem recognizing the sign. But our response to the signs are another matter altogether. Because based on response, you either obey or ignore. Negative consequences occur when signs are ignored. Some of you texters, mm -hmm, that you? Texting while driving. I just need to let them know. They got to take them up in a minute. And then, of course, the next thing you know, then you are in a accident. Now, because my job is to help you kind of with life and to have future, most of you can't drive without texting. <laughs> but you're not supposed to be texting while 
we tend to ignore signs because they are for other people. They're not for us. Because in the major areas of life, we get signs. Oh, yeah, I'm getting ready to get in your house. Open the door. Think about your health. Some of you are under great pressure because I'm your pastor. And I'm not a pastor that's not here. I'm a pastor that counsels. I'm a pastor deep into your lives. Some of y'all are under enormous stress in life. And the way that some of y'all deal with it is you eat more. Gain weight. Sometimes when I see people put it on a lot of weight, I know it is, it's a depression is underneath it. They're not feeling good about life. They're not feeling good about themselves. And so they eat. Well, why do they eat? Because food don't talk back. <laughs> food is good. It tastes good. It agrees with you that it's good. But the next thing you know, when that sign is ignored, the next thing you know, there's a stroke. There's a heart attack. There's some serious health issue that if the signs had been paid attention to, then a bad situation could have been avoided. Finances. Why it's quiet now. Some people spent money before the recession like it was going out of style. They spent and spent. Some people were spending money on two incomes like they had three. In the delusionment, the disillusionment, that the money was just going to keep coming in, keep coming in. And then the recession hit. One lost their job or both lost their jobs. No savings. No emergency monies. Gone. As the scriptures say, great was the fall of it. Because when people understand that God has not promised you a job on tomorrow, and as one of my bosses said, nobody promised you a job forever, then you understand your need to have savings, to have emergency money. You understand your need to put God first and you pay your tithes. So when the hard times come, you can deal with it because you have something to fall back on. Am I making some sense up in here? But when you ignore those signs, then it's bankruptcy and collapse. Many times when I'm counseling in marriage, the problem ends up doing with the money, ladies and gentlemen, big time. The money causes huge problems. Jesus' final coming is preceded by these signs, some of which are visible now. The fall of Jerusalem, the spread of the gospel, the cooling of love in the church, the state of the world, chaos. Know what he says in my text verses in verses 4 through 8. He said, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I'm the Christ. They'll deceive many. You'll hear wars, rumors of war. See to it, you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom, famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. I know there are many of you saying, well, this has always occurred throughout history, these things, and you are absolutely correct. These are general signs that have occurred throughout history, but in the end time, they increase with intensity. It's like when you turn the, the eye on your stove, you, stove, you, you get the flame. And the flame may start low, but then the flame escalates with intensity. And that's how the end times work. All this stuff will be happening, but it will be happening in a much greater intensity than ever before because we are now in a world of flame. War, including civil wars everywhere. Just look at what's going on in the Ukraine today. Yesterday is Egypt and Korea and these other places, famine and pestilence. Africa, India, fighting in the Middle East, the breakup of our society, a society today that no longer relies on the Word of God, 
a society that says whatever I think is right is right. That's how can a marriage work? How can a society work when everyone does what is right in their own eyes? This is the standard. The Word of God tells us how to live our life and to have our life blessed. Oh, preach. Thank you. Thank you. People live together without marriage. And they want God to bless the marriage. And now we're being told that, you know, men who are attracted to men and women who are attracted to women can marry. Now, let me be clear. I'm not judging anyone because who people get attracted to is who they get attracted to. I understand that. But that don't make it right. Just because you feel something, don't make it right. And then in Matthew 24 and 13 and verse 14, we are told that the ones who endure to the end, that's the one that's saved. Jesus wants us to persevere because he wants to know when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? And to teach us patient endurance, to teach us preparedness for his second coming. We get in the 25th chapter the parable of the ten virgins. I don't even know if they could write this story today. Where are you going to find ten virgins? <laughs> Help us, Lord. Their culture was different from ours. Know what's said in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 4. At that time, the kingdom of heaven would be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and what? Five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil and jars along with their lamps. So very quickly, because we'll be heading into altar call now. In that culture, In that Jewish culture, the, the wives were betrothed at very young ages. Many scholars actually think that Mary was betrothed to Joseph at the age of around 14 or 15, and they're probably correct. It didn't mean that they went away and consummated the marriage right away, but they were betrothed. Now, we call that engaged today, but in that society, they were legally married, even though the marriage had not been consummated. Then there was going back and forth about what the dowries would be and making all the plans. But the key would be this. One day, which was usually a year or more later, the bridegroom would come along with his men and go to get the bride and her bridal party and then take them all back to his house where they would have the wedding banquet and then the party would begin. No one knew when the bridegroom was coming. So you have to be clear, in Jesus' time, he couldn't have gave a better way to explain his second coming. That you're not going to know the day, you are not going to know the hour. Now, I want you to note another thing. These ten people, these virgins, are differentiated by one thing only. What makes five wise and five foolish it's just one thing, oil. So they would have their lamps. Unlike our lamps today, like this one, which not turning on, was battery operated. These battery operated lamps don't work half the time either. They had to have oil. And the oil was used to, to light the lamp. And you had to have enough oil that you would be ready when Jesus came or when the bridegroom came in the, in the story. The Bible says all ten of them went to sleep in verses 5 and 6. It said they went to sleep because the bridegroom was a long time coming. They fell asleep. And then at midnight the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Did you hear what I said? All ten were asleep. It's all right to go to sleep if you're ready. Jesus could come in the middle of the night while we sleep. The issue is not when he come. The issue is, y'all got it. I'm almost done. The issue is, 
Are you all ready? You got to look and be ready. You got to look for a second coming and be ready. And the oil represented two things. One, preparedness. Now, no, this is, I'm going to help somebody real fast. I'm going to help you with these people who are asking you for a lot of money all the time. I'm going to help you. Say, you want me to help you? You want me to help you? All right, here it comes. So when the bridegroom came, the five foolish ones, they went to the five wise ones and said, wait a minute, the bridegroom is here, loan us some of your oil. So the five wise ones said, can't help you. Because if we give you some of ours, we don't have enough for us. They told them, go buy yourself some. Now, when you are dealing with people who have been irresponsible in their personal life, you done saved your money, you got emergency funds, you done, you done went to men's warehouse instead of buying our monies, and now here they come looking for you, tell them go and buy it themselves. Tell them buy it. Tell them, can't help you. Because, see, there comes a time when irresponsibility, there is a cost to be paid for living an irresponsible life. And at that point, they went off to go buy their own. But when they went off to buy their own and came back, they were gone. The wedding party was gone, and the Bible says the banquet door was shut. I want my altar workers to come forward now. Because they represent these five foolish ones. Many of the church people today, because you got 10 of them, but they were indistinguishable. You could not look at them and know which were wise or foolish other than knowing who's got the oil. And many scholars say it also represents the Holy Spirit because you cannot be saved. You cannot be ready for Jesus' second coming, and you are not living in Christ. And the Bible says the Spirit, Holy Spirit, puts us in Christ. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to worshiping with you at either our 9 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. Sunday services that are biblically based, illustrative, contemporary, and timely. Our services cater to men, women, the young, and young at heart. We also invite you to join us for Tuesday night Bible study at 7.45 p.m. and Lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. We are so thankful for your continued support of this ministry. And if this excerpt from our service touched your heart to either give financially to the ministry or to purchase the entire worship service on either CD or DVD, please call 708-283-0383 or visit us online at www.victoryapostolicchurch.org. 